Eddie Lenahan here, and we're here in my garden today, and you can hear the buds singing. It's in the middle of COVID-19, and thanks be to God, we're, you might say, at peace here. Beautifully, beautifully country. The birds singing, as I say, sun shining, and it's good to be alive in the middle of all this, this terrible pandemic. And there's always something to be thankful for. Nature, nature is a grand thing too. And uh, please God, we'll soon be out of this. Now, I was talking about Biddy early and the hopeful woman that she was in bad times. And she was. And if she was here today, I bet you there would be f people flocking to her because in the bad times that she lived in, we can't imagine them today. And there were bad times and people came through them. People came through those bad times. She helped them to come through those. And the cues that she gave to people depended on people themselves too. And within four miles either side of me, there are two bridges. Now, Biddy Early always put great stock on bridges as boundaries to do maybe with the fairies, to do with ghosts, to do with places that you should be passed at certain hours. On one of those stories, let me just say this. If you weren't, if you didn't do what Biddy told you precisely, if you weren't passed a place, for example, that Biddy to told you to be passed at a particular time, then you wouldn't get the cure. You wouldn't get the cure. Now, there was this particular man who went to her. Somebody in the house was sick. And he went. The journey was about 12, 14 miles. Walking, of course, he went that time. Because remember, she died on the 23rd of April, 1874. In my book, the latest edition of it, I actually have her death set there. For I found it at last. Which goes to show she was no legend, she was no myth. But he went to her anyway and she gave him the bottle. She gave him a little bottle and told, told him, bring that home and be home, she said, before the sun will set. Make sure of that, that you're inside in your own house before the sun sets or else. <laughs> she hadn't to say any more. He understood. So anyway, he thanked her and he came home. But, but, that was a but. He was almost home. He was within a quarter of a mile of home. And the sun was nearly gone down, but it was still bright. And he was just above a Drumcanora bridge, which is only four miles from us here, above near Drum Drumore Forest Park. And he met this old lady, a neighbour of his, a neighbour, a good-natured old woman. She came out to talk to him. And they were chatting away, chatting away, and you know yourself, when people start chatting, they'll forget about this, that and the other. And suddenly he noticed that the sun was almost gone down. It was half gone down. And, oh Lord God, the, the cure, and he remembered what Biddy had told him, and he ran for it. But the sun was just gone down over the horizon as he made it in the door, just in the door. It wasn't fully dark yet, in the door. And he went up into the room where the man was in bed. Maybe it was a brother of his or, I don't know, a son. It was a member of the family anyway. And he applied the cure, gave the bottle the way that Biddy told him. And, and as I heard the story from the man that told me, the cure almost worked. The man partly recovered but his head was always twisted slightly sideways afterwards. He hadn't done exactly what Biddy told him. The sun was nearly gone down, but, but the man always had a twisted head afterwards. And the man who told me the story knew, knew the man who got the cure as an old man, but his head was always slightly twisted. The man, the man hadn't obeyed her orders precisely. Now that's above there at Drumcanora Bridge, I could show it to you. And up there on the Gough Road, there's another bridge, Bunnahow Bridge they call it. It's on the N18, the old road to Gough, before they built the M18. Bunnahow Bridge was a place that they all, Biddy Early, always warned people to be passed. 
at night. And several people went to BD, of course, from Goth and from all the places around because it wasn't too far to her place over in Fiegel. But she always warned them if they had to pass that place at night that that was not a lucky place. Be past it by a certain hour or else. The or else, <laughs> she never had to explain to them, but it was a case of there'd be something waiting for you there. It wasn't a lucky spot. And I know several stories about that place. Man was killed there during the Civil War. A black dog used to appear there. A man, I remember the story, a man coming there on, on a night uh, from the fairing got with his horse and cart and suddenly he felt the horse being pulled backwards and the horse trembling and sweating and when he looked back there was a huge black dog with his teeth sunk into the back of the cart and he pulling the whole thing backwards, horse and all. Now how could a horse and cart be pulled back by a huge black dog? It was one of them, one of the, the boys. And he ran, ran in a panic to a nearby house where he saw a light and the woman was still open. <laughs> and he explained the woman handed him out a bottle of holy water and he ran and sprinkled the holy water. Gone. Dog gone. It was uh, one of the, the other crowd. And there wasn't just one story about that. There were several. And Biddy always warned people about that place don't be near that place at a certain time because they'd be there. So she seemed to know that at river crossings, bridges, whatever, because they can't cross running water, but they'll be waiting at running water at the other side for you. That seems to be with those. They can't cross it, but they can wait on either side for you. It seems to anger them that they can't cross it. So she was she was a woman of knowledge in the best sense of the word, a bamfasa, but she was always for your good, except in one case, if you had been either to a priest or to a doctor before going to her, well, she'd run you. No way. She wouldn't cure you then because you hadn't shown faith in her. You came to her first, you came to her first. That was your way of wanting a cure badly enough. And I suppose, you see, it's the very same way today. People go to Lourdes or Fatima or Medjugorje. If you don't have faith, don't bother going. What's the point? But if you have faith, well then you go. People go there with faith, looking for a cure or a favour. Otherwise, there is no point. Biddy was the very same. And it just shows she had she had pride in what she did. She wasn't an old hen wife, as they call them in England or whatever. She wasn't an old crone or an old hag. She was proud of what she did. When people went to Biddy early, they went naturally for a cure or whatever trouble they had. But usually it was for a cure for sickness either in a person or in an animal, or maybe it was for problems that they had with the good people, the fairies, Nadina Ushla, call them what you like. But sometimes, sometimes, Biddy, she left them with a choice. Very often the choice was your own. And there was one story I heard of a terrible, awful choice that a man had. He was a man who had one child, a young son, and his wife died, and he married again. Now, we've all heard stories about, oh, the wicked stepmother, she's probably one of the most common figures in, in storytelling, in mythology and all the rest of that. But this man, his new wife, the child, the child and the woman got on very, very well indeed. But the man had a horse. And that horse, they were obviously poor people, the horse was their sole way of living. He used to be bringing turf out of the bog, he used to be carrying, he used to be ploughing. The horse was his living. But <clears throat> the horse got done up 
I don't know what happened to the horse, but the horse got done up anywhere somewhere, and, of course, he had no choice but to go to Biddy Early to see could she, in some bloody way, do something for the horse. And, and he can't tell anywhere, and she said, look, she said, I will, but something will have to go instead of the horse. And of course, he had had things like that before and he was, would say, apprehensive to say the least. And she said to him, look, tonight at 12 o'clock, the child will sneeze three times. And if you want the child, say God bless us. And if you say God bless us, you'll have the child, but you won't have the horse. And the man, of course, well, <laughs> and he said, well, what? Well, she said, if you say God bless us, you'll have the child, but you won't have the horse. And if you don't say God bless us, you'll, you'll have the horse, but you won't have the child. And it was an awful, an awful kind of a choice in one way. Now, you would think to be no choice at all, child or horse. But he thanked her and he came home and he told the stepmother, his wife, and... They had their supper, and the wife said to him, of course, look, you can't, you can't leave a, a child go for the sake of a horse. It isn't right. No human being should be left go for an animal. But uh, they went to bed anyway, and midnight came, and the child sneezed once. Nothing. And the child sneezed twice. Nothing. And the child sneezed the third time. And the stepmother said, God bless us. <laughs> and the father said, Why did you say it? And the woman said, If his mother was here, she'd say it. They went out in the morning, and there was the horse with the four legs up in the air, stone dead. And the man that told me the story, I remember it yet. I remember him saying, wasn't she a great woman? And she only a stepmother to the child. Wasn't she a woman with breeding? Wasn't she a woman with breeding? And she said, and he said to me, they got on great afterwards and built up and got on well. But he said, if that child had been allowed to die that night instead of the horse, They'd have had a torture of a life afterwards. It was probably true for him. They'd have been at each other's throats forever after. But they got hungry. But wasn't she a great woman when you think of it? And she only, I won't say only, but she was only the child's stepmother. So, you know, the, the, but you can, you can understand his, you can understand his terrible dilemma too. They had nothing. They had nothing, you know. None of us understand. None of us understand what we might do when we are put under terrible pressure and we have no choice. So, so, it was that kind of a story. It was that kind of a story when you're in the dark of the night and your back is to the wall, you don't know what you will do. But sometimes there was the kind of choice Biddy left to people. She didn't make it easy for people. In 19th century Ireland, when times were tough, people were poor. And when the landlords ruled, and if you hadn't your rent twice a year on the Gale Day, if you got sick that time, it was a disaster for you because your family were more than likely to be thrown out on the road. What would your family do? Huh? Now... At that time, it was vital to have somebody like Biddy Early if somebody did get sick or if an animal got sick. Because we'll say if you had only one or two cows or if you had a horse and you were depending on that horse, which person more than likely was depending on that horse? 
it was a disaster if a person or the animal got sick. You went to Biddy early. She was a wise woman, she was a sensible woman, and if you went to her, she gave you sensible advice. Sometimes she cured, sometimes she didn't. But it was up to you. Now, if you're going from Ennis here in County Clare back towards Kilrush, <laughs> you'll come to a village, a long village, <laughs> Lissy Casey. And by God, it is a long village. It never seems to end. And there isn't anything much there except two speed limits <laughs> and a pub and a church and everything in between is just, oh my God, whenever I get out of this place because it is so long. A nice place. And they keep it very, very well indeed. It is a, a nice village. But, but, in that place at that time, there was this family, poor, like most others, and... There was three sons and there were two daughters. And all the time it was a struggle for them to make ends meet. Especially when it was coming up to the gale day, rent day. How were they going to pay? And I suppose it wore them down, eventually. And they decided they'd send one of the sons, the eldest son, to America. To see, could he make something of himself? And maybe them also. Now, the fare to America that time was five pounds. A huge sum of money, <laughs> five pounds today, five euros, wouldn't buy you a pint, hardly. But in those days, it was a big sum of money. They hadn't it, but somehow they scraped it up. Maybe the neighbours contributed, maybe the local priest contributed a little bit, who knows, but they scraped up the fare. And they took him, they, brought, they took him down to Queenstown in Cork, Cove, as they call it now. That's where the sailing ships pulled in. And... They wished him well, wished him Godspeed and may you do well, John. And they saw him off and they sailed. And at that time it took roughly six weeks for a sailing ship to get to America, depending on winds and tides. But they made it safely. And, of course, seen through Ellis Island, I don't know what his name changed or not, like so many Irish people's names were changed because, remember, a lot of them had their names in Irish that time and, you know, a garbled uh, version of your name often came out. But he was, he was let through. And we know, we know that this was a true story because he landed just as the American Civil War was starting, 1861. Now... It was either for his good or bad, who can tell? But, like most Irishmen, he joined the Northern Army. We don't know was he conscripted or not, but it was into the Northern Army he went. Now, he must have been a good soldier and a brave lad because he fought all through the battles of that horrible, terrible, bloody war. Cold Harbour, the three-day battle, etc., etc. He fought through them all. And... With every payment he was getting, every cent he could spare, he was sending it home to the people at home because he remembered, he remembered the hard times at home and the efforts to pay the rent. But in any case, he must have been a brave soldier because by the time that civil war was over, he had been promoted to be a captain. And when they were demobilised, he was let go and... I don't know how much how much they got in their payment when they were demobilised. <laughs> Americans will know it better than I do. But it was mo about $50 or thereabouts. And I presume, maybe I'm wrong, that they were paid in gold. Maybe not. Maybe it was paper money, but it was $50-ish. And that boy did what most immigrants did not. Most of them. You see, you fought there, you were granted American citizenship, which was a valuable thing. He didn't stay. He came home with his money and he bought out the lease on the farm from the landlord. And, of course, you know as well as I do that an awful lot of those landlords, there were spendthrifts. They lived above their station smoking cigars and drinking brandy and over in London with their friends, English landlords. Ah, he bought it out and he built three new houses on the site, on the farm, I should say, and he had enough left for dowries for his two sisters. 
Now remember, of course, at the time, if a girl hadn't a dowry, she wasn't going to get married, at least respectably. And even at the time, if a girl wanted to be a nun, she had to be at a dowry. And that's not gone away. That's not gone away. In a good third, maybe a half of the world, in the year 2020, if a girl hasn't a dowry, she's not going to get married. She's not going to get married. So we think in our stylish West, <laughs> we might think what we like, but we're living in a, in a little paradise of our own in the West. There's an awful lot of the world where a poor girl is a poor girl, let us say, and that is all. But, but that's what he did. Built three new houses, one for himself, one for his, each of his brothers, and he had enough for his sisters. That was great. Now, his mother was still living in the old house and he was living with her for the moment while the new houses were being built and finished. But uh, this particular night, he was walking out. There was nobody in the new houses yet, but he was proud of himself. He was walking out this night and he saw a light in the window of one of the new houses where no light should be. And he crept up to the window and he peeped in, and there inside he saw, at the big fireplace, a sow, a sow. And she facing in to the fire, there was no fire of course, there was nothing in the house yet. She facing in to the fireplace, and her backside out towards him. And of course he, holy God almighty, what's this? And he ran back to the old house to his mother, and he... My mother, my mother, and his mother in the name of God, what's wrong with you? What's wrong? She thought he had a drink taken or something. And calmed down, she, she calmed him down anywhere, and, and, and what, 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 what? And he told her what he was after seeing out there in the new house. And she was, of course, what, what? And you'd wonder now, why should that frighten a man who had seen terrible things as a soldier? Blood and murder and dismembered bodies and God only knows what. But he was obviously very frightened and he pulled out his mother to have a look. And she looked in the window and, holy God almighty, she thought it was the devil or something. And you'd think now the first reaction of a woman like that, an old religious woman, would be, get the priest. But no. She said, she said, get, get, go, go for be the early. Strange reaction, but, but he did, he did. He bought out a horse, a saddle horse from one of the neighbours. It was coming near dawn now and off he went to Biddy early. Now, that was 20 miles into Ennis, 9 miles and 11 miles more out to Fiekel, where Biddy lived at a place called Kilbarren. But of course when he arrived it was broad daylight and there was a queue at Biddy's house. There was always a queue of people at Biddy's house. She was famous by this time and he had to take his place in the queue. But at last, at last, he was next in line at Biddy's door. And there was Biddy standing at the half door, because every cottage had a half door that time. And obviously a, a woman's invention <laughs> to live out the smoke and keep out the hens. Very practical. There was Biddy standing at the half door and she says, Ha, 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 uh, the man from Lissy Casey. And now stunned him. How'd she know? But Biddy would know. She'd frightened the life out of people. You could come from 50 miles away and she'd know you by name. She'd know what brought you. But she took him in, made a cup of tea for him. And then she said, well, she said, <laughs> there was no more noise out of it. She said, there's a river behind your house, isn't there? And there was. And he was wondering, how, how did she know? And she said, there's a tree knocked across that river, huh? And a short time before, three or four weeks before that, there had been a storm and it knocked the tree across that river. It was more a stream than a river, not very big, but there had been a tree knocked across that river. And she said, the back window of the middle house, how did she know there was more than one house? The back window of the middle house, she said, did you notice that there's a pane of glass broken? No, he said. I didn't. This was his own house now. How did she know? Well, she said, she said, they're coming across the stream, across that tree, 
and in that window that's broke. And if you don't go home and cut that tree and fix that window, you'll never sleep in that house. Who are they that she mentioned? He knew, he knew. The fairies, of course, the good people. First thing he did was, he put his hand in his pocket to pay her. Go home, she said, go home. Do what I tell you. And he did go home and cut the tree immediately. Got his hatchet, cut the tree, and then he went into Ennis. When he looked, of course, looked up, and there was at the top of the window a little triangle of glass broken that he had never noticed before. In his own window, in his own house. But he went into Ennis, bought a new pane of glass, fitted it himself, and there was no more trouble, no more bother. But how did she know? Because Biddy would know. Biddy would know if anybody knew. There was no more bother, but of course, the house was built on a fairy path. Biddy knew. And that so-called sow, the big pig that was there beside the fireplace, that was no pig. That was one of them, them, letting him know that if you, if you don't do what you should do, We'll be here, but you won't be here. So the old people were always, always very, very careful of things like that. Where a fairy pat might be, where a fairy bush might be, a lone white thorn bush, a shkach. And to this very day, they're that. An awful lot of the old people are a fairy fort. They won't interfere. But in the older times, Biddy was there to guide them, and people like Biddy was there to guide them, to make very sure they didn't make that kind of a mistake that would cost them dearly. Because if you build a house in a place like that, do you want to have to abandon your new house? Or worse again, demolish it? <laughs> well, it's a lot easier to do the right thing first, rather than to have to go through a very, very costly procedure later. She was a most, most useful woman, and that's the reason why she's so vividly remembered to this day. My book, In Search of Biddy Early, and also Meeting the Other Crowd, there's stories about Biddy Early and that. How many editions has that gone to? Simply because people know about, about her, and they remember her, and they know that you don't disturb certain things without consequence.